And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have some returning good brothers to the temple, coming to us straight from 23rd Century Studios, the... The the mad bastards behind bat behind Battle Lords of the Twenty Third Century, which is now kickstarting its fully ar its fully armored gear manual, which has met which has managed to which is which is managing to get pretty damn close to its um, to its initial goal. Congra congratulations on doing so well, by the way. In one corner we have Tony Oliveira. In another in the second corner we have. David Sirocco, and in the third corner we have Kurt Willis. I will let you decide which of wh which of whom is the biggest motor mouth of the three. <laughs> How you guys doing tonight, man? On, we're doing well. It's good. It's good to. It is. It is good to hear. It's been. It's been about a. It's been about a year since I've had since I had you on. How you how have you guys been been holding up with the uh, with the onset of the uh, win of the winter coming in. Well, I'm not a fan of the weather, but you know, it, it uh, helps helps our productivity, which is great because we got a huge backlog of stuff we're trying to get done. <laughs> yeah. I'm in Florida, so the weather really doesn't change. It goes from yeah. hot to not so hot. He doesn't count. <laughs> um, so the weather doesn't really change things very much in terms of me going. Out. Yeah. What, well, let's make it easier to do things like. Clearing lumber, you know, clear a bunch of trees and cut them up into bits, and then split them by hand. It's not as hot and sweaty. If you have to deal with trees, do you shout timber? No, I already know what to do. Oh, that's disappointing. Maybe it's just the Minnesotan in me, but you got you. Got, if you're chopping down trees, you got to shout timber. Oh, these are already these have already been felled. I'm just taking the. From the pile, that's just the logs, and turning them into little chunks that then get split into little bits that can be thrown on a fire. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so, so in that way, everybody can pre can pretend that they're good at making s'mores. Exactly. Yep. Oh, but last time I last time I had you guys on was for the Kickstarter for the um, adventure collection that was Charlie Foxtrot. And now, you're, now you're going in with the with the gear manual known as fully armored. Um, is now we've we've covered we've covered quite a bit on the hit on the history and insanity that is Battle Lords throughout the years. But would it be fair of me to say that that full, that um this seventh edition fully armored is the, is the first step in you guys trying to take some take some of what came before and update it for the current seventh edition? A little bit, somewhat. Um, a lot of the equipment and weapons in the older books um, we couldn't use due to copyright. You know, you can't really use uh, certain names for for guns because, well, they're owned by the trademark company. So we had to get creative with with some of that but there's actually a lot of new stuff in it too mm -hmm. um the original books kind of gouached everything towards the low end where we tried to spread it out a little bit more and this is more fills in the gap mm -hmm. i think tony would say yeah and keep keeping that keeping that in mind did you guys did you guys have a general guideline about about aside aside from aside from copyright things um what it, what would what was keepable and what and what might need retooling? Most of the old weapon systems just needed a little tweak here and there to bring them from sixth edition to seventh edition. Uh, really, one of the main goals that we had for fully armored was, like Kurt said, in seventh edition we've got this nice sort of distribution of, of weapons and equipment from low end to medium to high, so you can you can progress. 
you know, from using the sharp pointy stick all the way up to the anti-tank Omega weapon. Uh, so with fully armored, what we really wanted to do is add some more weapons along the way that of that distribution. So um, you've got more choices as, as you're progressing through the through the power levels in the game. Mm-hmm. And um, okay. um, part part of it was really just as we look at the changes in the uh, way the core mechanics work from a weapons perspective. Certain weapon systems have been integrated. For example, frost guns, um, web guns, flamethrowers all have a core physics behind them. They spit a liquid at a distance, mm-hmm. right? So there's a common weapon now we call it goo guns that do all of that so of course in the past you had three different sets of weapon systems with kind of similar rules now we have one unified set of systems so there's there are places where we've combined things from prior editions so you don't get upgrades of those so to speak but rather new weapons because they really didn't exist before Mm -hmm. um there are certain mechanics that we've added so we've got we're trying to fit in a couple new things um the rules and uh, with those some weapons from the older books mm-hmm. so there's there's kind of a mix of old and new there's uh, to fill in so the uh, as, as i said before the the skew was towards the lower end by putting in things in the upper ends we started to put in uh interesting tweaks on certain weapon types as well mm-hmm. so again new weapons that were not in previous editions. yeah now i'd l- I'd like to go. I'd like to go into a bit of a bit of what the what the book is going to be is going to be is going to be having. And one of the things I'd like to start with is the is the continuation of the timeline because <coughs> this is one of this is timeline timeline in TRPGs is one of those is one of those things I'm always iffy about because uh, because of the risk of um. Of continuity lockout that can happen. Obviously, it's not it's not a universal case, but it's something that the that the possibility is there. So when it comes to advancing the storyline, as G as GW fans like to call it in a curse word, um, what steps do you guys make sh- do to make sure that it that it is that um that you that foreknowledge of of certain events isn't necessarily a requirement for a given table. We do a couple things. So, and, and one the 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 battle or the galactic year, I should say, in battle wars is thirty months. And typically, in a timeline, we're only moving forward about ten months at a time out of those mm-hmm. thirty. So we're not covering a lot of time. Um, uh, in addition to some events that sort of move the timeline forward, uh, a lot of the, uh, for example, in fully armored, it references the events that transpire in the scenarios that were included in charlie foxtrot mm-hmm. so people can kind of see you know even if their characters played that or, or or in this case if someone else has have played that scenario how it would have turned out uh in the official lore or in the official canon um of the game so you can when you're reading through the timeline you're like, oh yeah i remember playing that scenario and how did it turn out for those guys oh not great they all died um so it's uh uh, you know that, that's how we sort of address that is is we we reference the events that people have probably played through hopefully played through um and then uh, the the increments moving forward are relatively small mm-hmm. now and i'm and i'm guess i'm guessing i'm guessing that you're not going to fall into the same trap that say battletech does where certain where certain tech and certain options aren't available at certain point at certain points in the timeline No, no, no I, don't to, I was going to say we've tried to stay away from that just to prevent uh, what you said, the you know overlapping or um, or just not being able to use the equipment due to you know DM's discretion. But uh, for the most part, uh, anything in this could be from any of the species around. So yeah, mm-hmm. we're, we're trying to avoid that. Yeah, no. there are there are allowances though to. For GMs that want to play in that space, some people do like to play in that space, and uh, so there's an uh, there's a underlying theme that was created in the prior edition that we've carried forward, which is um, not carrying really super high tech weapons into, into low tech places and that kind of thing. So there's always a uh, way to 
quote unquote house rule things in and say, well, this world, the low tech world, you're not allowed to bring that Omega weapon on here. Sorry, that's a tech seven weapon. You're not bringing that in. It's not happening. Or maybe going to a, a highly populated world where they have a lot of gun restrictions because they don't want bad lords running around shooting places up because they'll be way more powerful than any of the local cops and they just don't want to deal with it. Yeah, you want you want the special forces, not the special forces. Exactly. <laughs> oh. Now, one of the other th one of the other things that's brought that's brought up on the on the bullet points is advanced and optional combat rules. Um I'd like to, I'd like to start with the advanced combat rules. I'm guessing that this is expanding on on certain on certain rules in on certain rules in the core, in the core book and i'm curious what ex, what ex, what would be some examples of that expansion sure we um in some cases those rules are designed to be less crunchy and faster um and in other cases um they they expand on the crunch mm -hmm. um and in some cases it's just a different way of doing things to give you an example of the latter um, in Battle Lords, when you're firing a fully automatic weapon, you make a single attack roll, and then you roll a die to figure out where they all hit, all your all your shots hit. And the more weapon, the uh, the more kick the weapon has, the larger the die you use for that roll. Um, so it's possible you can roll a number that does not correspond to a body section. In that case, it would be a miss. So the, some people don't like the idea that you can still make your to hit roll, but because of the kick of the weapon still miss all your shots. So there's alternate full auto fire rules in fully armored uh, for people who, you know, don't want to have that. If they, you know, like if they, if they make that to hit roll, they want to hit at least once. We didn't put that in the core rules because it adds a little bit more complexity. Um, we went for sort of quick and fast on full auto because that was where it kind of bogged down in sixth edition. And we wanted to stay with, fast and efficient mm -hmm. but for people who don't like our solution um there's an alternate one that they can now use in fully armored mm -hmm. and what was that was was that a was that a frequent thing where people where people were um, people in testing had had mentioned hitting and still missing it came up in con play as we were playing uh, at various conventions so mm -hmm. Um, just something that people notice is kind of like it, it didn't happen often, but when it does happen, it's just irritating, right? I got a hit, then I don't have any shots on the body, huh? Yeah, I can I can see how that could how that could be an issue, and in some ways, it, in some ways, it kind of reminds me of the of the ro roll to hit and then ro and then roll to see if your to see if your damage hits thing that World of Darkness can be infamous for. So you can so you can feasibly have situations where, where you ended up hitting, you ended up doing a decent amount of damage, but the actual wounds that you inflict are nil. And and it, that's kind of already baked into our system with threshold. So you know we didn't want to make that redundant. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, there's going to be some new weapon systems that you've that you've put into and um. I'd like to I'd like to go through I'd like to go through them just to get the general vibe of what of what they of what they do and what they and what they're going to be best at. And I'd like to start out with carousel guns. Carousel guns are are one of my favorites. I I know <laughs> Dave doesn't necessarily like them, but we I, I convinced him to, to keep them in the book. Um, so carousel guns are a kinetic weapon or projectile weapons. And essentially, um, I, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but like a Cinco Cyclotron particle accelerator, what they do is they take a, in this case, a, a bullet, essentially, and they use magnets to spin it faster and faster and faster and faster uh, until it goes out, uh, out the end of the barrel towards your target. Mm -hmm. So if you've got time to wait you can charge that thing up and do a lot more damage. Um, so I like them because it's that tactical trade-off of, do I take the shot now or do I wait another round standing here charging my weapon up to really get the the you know the hammer shot in? Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, I could be shot in the meantime. Uh, but uh, so I, I like them because it gives the player that sort of tactical choice of, you know, go for the quick shot now or the, or the, the bigger shot later. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, now, next is one of the... Is... Downfield now. Okay. <laughs> Although, I, I do have to ask, why why was there the argument about um about carousel guns? Uh, the, the main uh, limitation is that, as I said, there's a slug. And slug-based weapons have a fairly narrow range in the grand scheme of gameplay. They really tend to top out in terms of the things you can carry around as, you know, human-sized or even Rampython-sized critters running around on a battlefield. There's really only so much recoil you can handle. Mm -hmm. And so they have a limited range. Um, and so they, they, they top out early, um, damage-wise. Mm -hmm. So so next one, which... um. Did which did give me a bit of a laugh, and and I knew that I would have to ask about this. That is fist systems. First off, what's fist an acronym for? An acronym for a lot of pain. <laughs> well, I figured I figured that, but that's not good. But that's not exactly going to be satisfactory, though. <laughs> Fox, uh, I'm trying to remember. Fox interface striking strength. technology, strength technology. There it is. Yeah. Uh, I was going to pull up the book because it's been long enough. Oh, I have the wrong one. Uh, yeah, I think that's correct. I'll, I'll I'll dig around and find the the, uh, the book that that's in so that I can I can pull that and confirm that. But the 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 acronym is a holdover from uh, prior editions of the game. We we, we didn't want to touch that. We figured we'd get lynched. Um, mm -hmm. Force interface strength transfer. Force interface strength. Transfer. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, it's, it's been around for a while and it's very popular. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we know not to touch that one. <laughs> it basically shoots almost like a flux uh, shield out of your hand. Mm -hmm. So when they go to strike, it allows them to strike objects at a much greater force using that force shield. Mm -hmm. um, it just kind of builds onto that. So it makes a ram hit really, really hard. All right. Which I I'd say I'd say is warranted because with with a game like this, it could be very easy to have um to have range combat be the king of everything. Yeah, and that was I think part of the creator's point behind that is to give more options for hand to hand and a and a more modern feel. We've added a few weapons actually in the core rules mm -hmm. uh, again to do the same sort of a thing to expand the options in the hand to hand space. Um, the phase knife is probably the favorite because honestly, there's really very little you can't go through, mm. and if you hit, that's it. Yeah. Now, the next one that I'm looking at, um, Gauss rifles, is no is nothing new to si to science fiction. There's all there's always been there's been attempts to try and imagine what coil guns or Gauss rifles would look like in v in various works. So what I'm curious about is. Um, Battle Lords' take on this on this concept of co of coil guns. This one's really more in terms of a lighter weight projectile going hypersonic, so it, it's more about deeper penetration and doing damage through sheer velocity. Mm -hmm. And I'm oh, good. I'm um, guess, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that the um the downside with with the Gauss rifles is going to be well they ain't going to come cheap. You're you're paying for every shot you fire, so <laughs> it's sort of like a cheaper version of a missile where cheapers in air quotes. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be pretty large too. You can't you can't smuggle a Gauss rifle in your in your trench coat. <laughs> Somebody's going to notice. Not not even as a ram python. No. I'm sorry, sir. You can't bring that in. What? I don't have anything, uh, sir. I can I can totally see that entire Gauss rifle. It, it's taller than you, and um, well, you're a Ram Python, so it's pretty freaking tall. Uh, no, that's uh, that's a uh, Thwackum stick with with the trigger, sir. Uh, uh, quick, <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> um, but next is implosion torpedoes, which just the name alone gives me. Plenty of plenty of mental images of someone dividing by zero. Yeah, that one's kind of a fun concept. Um, it's a twist on the Omega weapons. It's sort of like taking an Omega weapon and 
mixing it with a flamethrower covers a lot of space all very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the scientific concept is imagine a self-propagating force field that uh, eventually degrades to the point that it collapses in and then basically implodes squishing what's inside it. Mm -hmm. So it basically hits multiple sections on a body very quickly. Yeah. Um, although I, I will admit when I saw a torpedo, I was, I was like, is this, is this going to be, is this going to be ship scale? Or is this personal scale? But the way you, the way you described it, it sounds like personal scale is just as likely. Yeah. Everything in fully armored is on the, uh, personnel scale of combat. Mm -hmm. Um, we had so many pieces of weapons and equipment, um, that we actually had to move all the vehicular weapons into a different book. So they're not in fully armored. It's all, um, personnel weapons mm -hmm. um, and uh, liked implosion torpedoes because it was that battle lord sensibility if well if i have a gun that can project force fields and i take it to its its most ludicrous and over the top potential as a weapon system what would i do and they're like well what if i put somebody in a giant bubble that just implodes when they're in it um yes yeah, so i uh, i always thought that was kind of amusing as, as a weapon system mm-hmm so next is neuro weapons. And I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that neuro weapons is something that can be both a um f a firearm as well as well as a melee weapon. Uh, they come in number a number of forms. Yeah, um, most of them are ranged combat, but I believe actually I think they all are ranged combat. Although we do have something that's kind of related. It was just called a stun baton, but mm -hmm. it it works more or less by the same mechanics. Um. They have a lot of different ways of, of targeting um, a sentient being. Um, some of them are more of a zap electrical kind of a thing. Some of them interfere with brains. Um, so they, they've got a number of different things that uh, kick off the air quotes saving throws, the the ECRs um, that you can then use to see how you're doing. Mm. They have a lot of interesting effects too. Yeah, neuro weapons took a ton of work into in the uh, in the seventh edition. That's one of the things I'm, I'm kind of proud of in the prior editions because neuro weapons affect different targets different ways and they work different ways. Each one essentially had a unique mechanic, and that was one of the things that we really wanted to get away from. So in seventh seventh edition, all of the neuro weapons essentially use a unified mechanic. It's it's close to the same mechanic for all of them in terms of how you um, resolve the effects and the damage uh, of the weapon. It should make them a lot easier to use and a lot less memorization, a lot less referencing the book because uh, mm -hmm. they all essentially work the same now, while while maintaining that that unique effect for each weapon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And the last, the last one that I'm curious about is pulse SMGs, and how that how that would be different from 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 normal types of SMGs. So pulse weapons are really designed around a large plasma slug going down range. Um, so it's somewhere on. Not, it's kind of like having a Gauss rifle, but slightly smaller, um, and designed to take a big chunk versus a small chunk and, and throw it for very long distances, more of a big chunk. So it's, it's kind of taking your particle accelerator and kind of, you know, bringing it down a few notches. Um, the Pulse SMG is the concept of, well, hey, a sec, wait a second, we got a, lot of, we got a lot of enemies out there, arachnids, that don't have a lot of armor, arachnids, and therefore <laughs> we really don't need a big, huge slug to go punching through them one at a time that takes too long it's not efficient so what if we had something that sprays a lot of plasma downrange very quickly so they decrease the sl uh, plasma slug size um and then boom all of a sudden you've got something that fires a whole bunch more plasma which gives you a lot more independent shots mm -hmm. um but it's sort of like going from you know 30-06 down to nine millimeter mm -hmm. <laughs> is that about right tony yeah, the, the the primary difference is instead of one thirty out six slug downrange, you're you're blasting you know eight to twelve <laughs> uh, uh, downrange with the uh, pulse SMGs. Mm -hmm. Then again, then again, SMGs are not are not built for accuracy; they're built for spray and pray. Exactly. Oh. Uh. Well, okay. and if and if that's if that sounds me if that sounds me being dismissive, my if someone played word association with the submachine gun, I will always end up thinking of the um, Sten guns. 
you know, that were made that were made to yeah. be d as dirt cheap as possible. <laughs> Folded and pressed steel. Yep. <clears throat> oh. Now, with, now, when it comes to when it comes to the um, new weapons that you're adding, obviously, going through all of them would be would um, be would be kind of pointless given how many you you guys are putting in. But would it be fair of me to say that that all of the major weapon types from Core are going to be accounted for here? Yeah, one of the goals we had with the core rules was to give people a lot of options and give them a lot of different uh, scale of play. So. Mm -hmm air quotes, first level to 20th level. Uh, and, and then as we looked at our page count and looked how far above our page count we were, we realized we we're going to have to make some cuts. So we did some things. We tweaked it. We got a lot of pages back and then realized, ooh, okay, now we have to cut till it hurts. And so we had to move a lot of material out of the core rules, which contributed to this book. And um, so what we wanted to do with this book is really focus on personnel weapons and really give people a lot of granular options from I got 10 credits to I've got 10 million credits. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find price points all the way on up that let people have a lot of options in the I've got between 10 credits and say 100,000 credits to spend on a gun, 100,000 to a million and a million plus. So you just kind of, there's, there's range eh, more like 50,000 to you know, half a million is kind of a, a pretty good range. Um, then over a half a million, you start getting into NBA typically for the for the opponents, and you tend to spend more. Yeah, but um, as a, I'd like to I'd like to kind of go th go through a bit of a, for lack of a better term, a greatest hits of of some of the possibilities. One one particular thing one particular thing I'd like to go into since, as we mentioned that as I mentioned the t given the um, temptation factor that we talked about earlier. Um, what new what new additions could you could you tell me when it comes to melee weapons? We put back a lot of the uh, I, I guess I call them quirky battle lords melee weapons that we didn't have room for in the core rules. Um, a lot of them are sort of species, not, I don't want to say species specific, but they were designed for a particular, by a particular species and the design philosophy sort of carries through. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the example I give everybody is the Ashinari, which is, a, uh, an old, an old battle Lords weapon, but it wasn't in the seventh edition for space constraints. And, mm -hmm. um, it's a Fintari weapon. Fintari are ruthless and Machiavellian and they're big into intimidation. They want, when they drop the one guy, they want the guy standing next to him to know, yeah, I don't really want to fight this one. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the Ashinari is essentially you take a, uh, a metal pipe, you saw off one end at a 45 degree angle and sharpen it. And the other end, you put a 12 gauge shotgun shell loaded with barbed flechettes that are wired to the back of the shell. Um, and then you, when you stab somebody with it, you detonate the shotgun shell, which fires the flechettes into the wound. And then when you yank the weapon out, uh, you, you basically like fishing for organs. You get to see what comes out along with the weapon. Uh, and it's, a, it's a typical Fintari design philosophy. I want to make this as morbid and intimidating and horrific as I can so that the next guy who me is going to go, yeah, I don't want to fight that guy. Um, but, uh, that, you know, we've got a lot of. Uh, melee weapons like that, that that sort of carry the the design philosophy of the species that built them, mm -hmm. uh, going back into the book. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. <clears throat> and when it comes when it comes to when it comes to ammo types, um, what what would be a few examples you could give me as far as what what this book is going to be adding to that front? I think a lot of um, we've got some standard ammunition additions, you know, armor piercing incendiary. But I think really where the book pushes the different types of ammo types are for uh, launched grenades, uh, because you really you've got a much larger projectile at that point. You can do a lot more things with it. You know, we've got grenades that freeze things, grenades that set things on fire, grenades that spew hyper acid, um, grenades that pop out little legs and scuttle towards the target um, that you can mix and match with the aforementioned grenades. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, new ammunition types for um, launch grenades and uh, magnetic grenades, which are mm -hmm. uh, anti-armor weapons. Uh, they'll latch onto whatever 
they hit and stick. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I know Dave's favorite weapon is the uh, is the Ordnance Two, Ordnance Ten reflex missile because it essentially is a grenade distribution system where it'll fly over a target and then disgorge 10 grenades of your choice into the blast area. Um, and again, you can mix and match and it'll create all kinds of fun and chaos uh, for your battle Lords game. And for those who love to play Orion rogues talking about chaos, uh, <laughs> you're going to want to watch for something we love to call the ding dong ditch. It leaves a flinging mess and ooh, discount. <laughs> oh, which, look, the closest the closest thing that I get to that I get to chaos is put is putting claymores at the top of ladders. <laughs> Effective yet messy. We actually have a new version of that that lets you load it with some grenades, so mm -hmm. you can choose what you want in there. Yeah, I just I just think I just think it's a very good a very good way to screw over pursuers. They're they're coming up coming up and get up the ladder. And the first thing they see is a claymore right in front of them. And we have claymores that launch glue now, which is all kinds of fun. <laughs> um, and there's also some equipment along those lines that are, uh, for lack of a better term, entry denial devices, ranging from you know things that go boom to full-on force shields to electrified force shields. So when they come up that ladder and go through it, they don't see it until they hit it. Mm -hmm. And then they get a nice little uh, uh, zapping feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> now, If you compare that with something else, then they get to watch while the little timer goes down. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it com now, when it comes to, when it comes to, ar when it comes to armor types, <clears throat> um, I'd I'd imagine a I'd, I'd imagine a lot of this is still built is still building on, the, on the arm on the armor setups from from before, um, although I'm a I'm a bit cur I'm a bit curious as to a couple of things. One, um, how bargain basement is bargain basement armor suits? Are we are we talking just are we talking just cardboard plate? There are actually some really good deals in the bargain basement armor. Um, it, it, on, it runs anywhere from 50% to 90% cheaper than an equivalent suit of armor. Um, like I said, there are some surprisingly decent suits in bargain basement. Um, the, the catch with bargain basement is, unlike standard armor, if it takes a hit, there's a chance for the protective measures in that section to completely fail which makes you vulnerable to hits to the same section afterwards. So there is a risk that we've built in to the bargain basement armor. It's not just less expensive, but it's essentially, uh, you, you, there's a trade-off for, mm -hmm. for that, for getting it cheaper. Uh, and that's that it, it's much more prone to failing than your standard armored suits. Yeah. Now, when it comes to concealable armored suits, is it a, is it a case where, where it's an where it's a where it's a suit that could that could fold up or how exactly is it concealable? It looks like clothing. Uh, it would allow you to walk around, um, you know, sans helmet, obviously, uh, but allow you to walk around out in public and and not have someone go, "Oh my God, that person's wearing mechanized battle armor." Uh, it's not going to take as much abuse as a standard suit of armor, but you mm -hmm. can't wear bare combat armor to dinner. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I will I will admit when I saw that I I immediately I was I immediately was like wait a minute is this is this like that is it like that suitcase suitcase armor from Iron Man? <laughs> I love the suitcase. I'm a huge Iron Man comics fan. I've been collecting them since the '80s, but and that was I love the suitcase armor. But no, uh, we actually didn't put that in the game. Although now that I think about it, I was like ah oh, missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when it comes to specialized armor, is that is that a case where it's per where it's purpose built for for certain ro for certain roles? How specialized is specialized armor? Uh, we basically have two. Um, a typically, specialized armor is either uh, species specific or built for a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
the Mazians uh, in Battle Orger Shapeshifters, and sometimes it sucks to be in this suit that is always humanoid in shape when you can change shape. So mm -hmm. there are some suits that allow the Mazians to utilize their shapeshifting abilities and still be armored. Uh, we have two feet species that are uh, that can fly. And we have suits of armor for them that allow them to fly while armored mm -hmm. uh, right out of the box. And we also have armored suits that are purpose-built for specific missions. If you need uh, a light armored suit capable of uh, exposure to space, if you're working on a mining vessel or something, where it's, you're, you're not necessarily going to be needing something built for combat, but it would be nice to have a little protection. We've got things like that. Um, we've got off-the-shelf suits for basically space explorers who, again, uh, can uh, encounter all kinds of hostile environments and occasionally maybe some hostile fauna, mm -hmm. um, but they're not expecting to have somebody shoot at them with pulse weapons. Uh, you know, So uh, uh, it goes from the, the, the whole gamut of this is built for a species, specific species, or this is built built for a specific purpose. Yeah, when it comes to when it comes to specialized armor, would there be would there be armor types for those who for those who prefer to not be not be seen out out in the wild? Yeah, and most of those types of suits are in the core rules. Uh, Spy master is the first one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, we also have. Uh, uh, the nightshade armor, which is also very, very hard to see, uh, basically stealth suits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know Spymaster is in the core rules. I don't recall if the nightshade is. I think it is as well. Um, so a lot of those ninja armor suits are in the core rules already. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some equipment that can also uh, take the place of that for a short duration. So you could uh, sneak around with it, but they degrade over time. Oh yeah, you don't you don't want anybody going around being the invisible man all the damn time. Makes it hard to shoot. Yeah. Um. Especially especially since what especially since once you're once you're shoot once you're shooting around the it'll be, it'll um kind of defeat the purpose of being semi invisible. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to when it comes to arm when it comes to armor um, option types, um, I'd say the the um, armor computer and PAI personalities I'd, I'd say is one thing that some, that some people some people coming into this bl com coming into this blind might not be as familiar might not be as familiar with. What would be the what would be the value in having having something like that inside one's armor? Um, the PAI or, or para artificial intelligence, they're limited AIs, mm -hmm. um, can basically do tasks for you that while you're in combat, you might be too busy to do yourself. So they help manage the armor and your weapons and they can do things for you. Um, one of the things that we did in uh, fully armored, and this is primarily as a role playing opportunity, mm -hmm. is we've detailed the various personality packages that you can get for your armor computer or your armor pai um and, and that way uh, you know some of them are obnoxious some of them are like drill sergeants um some of them are really overly helpful and um you you wouldn't expect to see something like that in in combat uh and but players can can role play these personalities their characters can interact with them other characters in the group can interact with them um uh, one of them we put in was for uh, based off of a live session that uh, B. Dave Walters on Twitter uh, ran for us. And in his game, all the uh, armor computers sort of sounded like Bob Ross, which was hilarious. <laughs> they were, you know, somebody get injured and they'd be like, "Oh, don't worry, you'll be fine. It's it's just a little head wound, just a little bandage, and you'll be all set. Maybe next time, Doc." <laughs> We were like, okay, we've got to put that in in the next book. But there are uh, there are a number of personalities you can choose for for uh, your armor computer. And the best part is they're all free. If you already have an armor computer or a PAI installed in your suit, you can pick whatever personality for it you want. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure. Th I'm pretty sure. I I know at least one person at my table who would have the PAI so 
have the um, personality sound like the micro machines guy. You know, the the guy who has the, the Guinness fast World, talking, yeah, yeah, who has the Guinness World Record for fastest voice. Which I am not going to replicate for obvious <laughs> reasons. We were thinking more along the lines of Marvin, you know, brain the size of a planet, and you want me to reload your ammo? <laughs> I'm not sure which is worse. So I'll, so I'll simply say that paired can't... with Mitsaken <laughs> discussing the intricacies of tracking a tachyon through a cloud bent by a rift of interspatial dimensions that would be worthy of at least a few milliseconds of thought. Instead, here I load ammo. It's done now. Is there anything else I can do? Please say no. Please say no. But even <clears throat> um, when it comes to when it comes to things like onboard power supplies, I'm guessing that would be backup power for some for um for more energy based approaches or or just backup power for the power armor period. Uh, one of the things we did in seventh edition, um, Dave put a lot of work into this, um, was so that if you had any energy-based weaponry, um, there were rules for taking the energy magazine out of one gun and putting it in another gun, and you could figure out how many shots you got. And uh, the same thing goes for um, gear and certain armor options that require power. Uh, so the advantage of having an onboard power system in your armor is if you're holding a gun, you can power it from the batteries in the suit. You don't necessarily necessarily need to put an emag um, in the weapon, so it's uh, it has the advantage of you don't have to worry about losing your mags, carrying your mags, um, running out of mags. You have a power supply built into your suit that you can plug whatever you need into. Mm -hmm. The laser weapons become really really popular. I'd I'd imagine when when you're not when you're you know, you still have to worry about you still have to worry about ammo counting, but not, but um, somebody can go a little bit DACA without, without too much worry. Yep, just a little. That, and, that and thunderbolt generators. You just you know, you're gonna you're not gonna use that entire uh, power source in one shot. So mm -hmm. you know, you got a few. Yeah. Now, one thing I'm a bit curious about if you guys are planning on doing so. Is 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 means of customizing their um, weaponry. Like I, th I recall I recall that that's something that that's something that was dipped into in co in core, and I'm guess and I'm wondering if that's going to be expanded upon. Well, I know Dave had done a little work with like underbarrel mounts. Um, most of the optic systems are usually built into the armor with, you know, your sensor systems, that kind of thing. But I think Dave did a lot of work with that. So I'll let him take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think part of what you were saying there, Kurt kind of hits on the point. A lot of the things that are typical to, to fiddle with on weapons, at least in modern context, um, really get replaced by sensors or, you know, why buy the latest, greatest tech seven, a mega weapon, the abomination to only to have basic iron sights on it. It, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it, the side part of it, the science part of it really kind of falls apart. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, we tried to you know aim for things that really, again, make sense in the context of intergalactic conflict. Right. We've got all these different species have come together. Mm -hmm where the places where customization would make sense. So having an under barrel rail system that integrates and provide for multiple options under your, under your main uh, firing weapon, typically a carbine or a, a rifle, you want to have, maybe you're going to go, you've got a concern of going up against Atlanteans and you want that Thunderbolt generator under your barrel so you can have a backup weapon just in case, or, or maybe you want a disintegrator mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, maybe you want to be able to go urban uh, combat and you want a quick and easy way to make your own door. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to blow a hole in the wall with the underbarrel disintegrator and then go through. Mm -hmm. A wall um, is just a door with a different kind of key. Exactly. 
So, so there's a little bit of, so it's sort of, it's a little less obvious in that sense, because a lot of them are really the options to bring together two different weapons that you can carry all at the same time and fire all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, more of the energy in terms of what's more visible is really in the grenades. You, if you want to have a grenade that uh, can walk up walls or you, you know, you throw it, you miss or you fire it and you miss, and it just walks over, crawls up the guy's armor and then sticks to his for, uh, faceplate. Mm hmm that's an option. Yeah. Actually, a couple options together, but yeah. <laughs> now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to like whenever that whenever there's these sort of expansions, um, something something that's always a bit always a bit of a concern is is um power creep, like having having ex in some games they'll have they'll have the problem where um, material in later expansions ends up outstripping stuff that's in core. Um, ha how do you get? How do you guys make sure that you don't have that issue where the stuff, the stuff that's in the stuff that's in um, fully armored, doesn't completely outclass the stuff in core? So we we had to deal with that actually in the core rules because we have weapon systems that start off at ten credits. I've got a pointy stick. Or I've got a 22, or I've, I've got a nine millimeter, um, and it has a certain value. You have to, you know, a certain amount of credits you have to spend, and a certain amount of value in terms of being able to get through armor. And you have to scale the armor and the weapons consistently across multiple weapon types and multiple armor types, so that you end up with a reasonableness of the scaling of the equipment. So you don't end up with, well, if I just buy this. 500 credit thing, I can blow away anything up to 20,000 credits. Um, so, so that was a, a, there's a lot of math behind keeping all that together. Mm -hmm. um, and a certain amount of it's just um, kind of knowing what fits and what doesn't. The, the good news is we've played this game for so long, we kind of know what works and what doesn't, so we can spot the obvious problems. Tony, you want to jump in with some other comments? And I was going to say, I am really good at finding those and exploiting them to nobody's business. Yeah, Kurt, if there's something that uh, we've made his job a little harder, but we've got two guys that are really good at finding that this is clearly the best bang for the buck. I'm going to buy a bunch of these. Um, but all of the weapons went through the same litmus test, um, regardless of class or weapon system, which was we figured out what suit of armor they could get through uh, on, on, a, on three torso shots. Uh, and that was sort of our, our basis. Okay, if this weapon can get through this suit of armor... In three shots, it should probably be priced equivalently to that suit of armor. So that was always where we started. And as Dave mentioned, there's a lot more math behind it um, than that, but that's sort of the, uh, the 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 basic test we did to make sure, even though I've got this new system, I'm still going to price it based on what kind of armor can it defeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to kind of jump in on the mechanics a little bit, for those who like to get a little crunchier or... People who are new and don't understand the, the battle word mechanics, we have a concept of threshold. So that's the thickness of metal stops. So, you know, thicker metal stops a, a bullet, and the thicker you make that metal, the bigger the, you know, projectile it stops in, in, in current day terms. That's why, you know, modern tanks really don't care about small arms fire. Um, then you've got um, what we call structural integrity, which is, you know, the amount of metal holding together that plate of armor over the chest. Uh, and then you have absorption, which is this concept of something that's squishy that takes away the impact, sort of like a shock plate uh, or a, a shock absorber on a car, absorbing that energy and dissipating it. It breaks down with every shot, but it, it's got a certain amount of damage soak that it does as the mechanic. And so with the weapon systems, they're all designed to target different aspects. So some, if they get past threshold, they just go straight through. Mm -hmm. So so the math gets very... Um, there's a lot of different angles to the math so you have to really look at it's not just you know one way of looking at what does it take to get through in three shots is it is it getting through in three shots because it gets past the threshold easily the absorption easily just rips out the, uh, the structural integrity bashes all of it down how is it getting there um also you end up with auto fire um so that's that's another angle of it um a, a part of the whole thing is um just going back to the science to do a certain amount of damage means a certain amount of energy delivered. Well, a certain amount of energy delivered has to start with a certain amount of energy expended up front. But there's a certain amount of, if you're taking a, a weapon that's going to do a bunch of dice of damage, 
then it's going to use a bunch of battery power, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so you'll end up seeing lower level weapons, the beginning level weapons, and to have you know high quantities if they're energy based. You know, they may have twenty five to fifty, and then at the top you might still have twenty five to fifty, but instead of a little e mag clip, a nice e magazine that's maybe pistol sized or maybe a little bigger. Now you're running around with a fairly substantial backpack of batteries just to fire 10 times. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, um, now as, as I understand it, you guys are shooting for about 196 pages. Um, but even, even with that, it sounds like there was a bunch of stuff that you guys re that you guys had to leave on the floor. Yes, that's our curse. We're like, <laughs> we have to have this, we have to have this, we have to have this. And eventually I'm like, guys, 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 we're going to blow past our limit. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to. So so vehicular weapons were one of the first things we realized very quickly. Yeah, th 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 they're out. They're, they're so gone. <laughs> There's yeah. over 80 pages in layout of just weapons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have to do some cutting. <laughs> and uh, part of that was... Um... I, we probably mentioned this the last time we talked, but uh, the the core rule book is not insubstantial. It's 540 plus pages. But we had when we were finished writing the core rules, we had 400 pages roughly of material that we did not use that did not go into the book because we couldn't make a thousand page book. And a lot of that material, at least in terms of weapons, equipment, um, cybernetics and armor are going into fully armored uh, plus some new stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Even then we had to trim some out uh, to get it to our targeted page number of 196 pages. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window for the, for the project? Well, the good news is since, like I said, most of that material was already written when the core rules was done, um, Kurt has most of the book already laid out. So if the Kickstarter is successful, and it looks like it's, it's going to be, um, or at least pretty darn close, we're basically just waiting on artwork, and we've got some of it done. Uh, but we use a lot of the funds we obtain uh, from the Kickstarter to pay the artists, because uh, we have a lot of art in our Battle Lords books, and we like to think it's it's high quality top top art because uh, we like the art uh, but it takes a little while to generate but the good news is unlike the core rules where we were starting from scratch this book is pretty much i mean if we didn't put any art in it we could release it probably now um so we're can but we're being pretty conservative in terms of our release date we're probably looking at the um end of the uh, first quarter of 2022 uh, or the beginning of second quarter of 2022. Uh, a lot of that depends on printing. Even if we're done, uh, the printing and the shipping still takes three months and there's nothing we can really do about that. Mm -hmm. um, and with the way the world is now, it might take a little longer than usual uh, to, to print and ship it. But uh, we expect to probably have it out the door um, early next year and then it'll just be waiting on the the printer and the shipper mm -hmm. there is that we're not shipping from asia so most of the jams that we're seeing at ports are actually on the west coast and so fingers crossed that doesn't change on the east coast uh and and we, we can avoid that that pain mm -hmm. um and i'll just add a clarification um we're, we're at actually 192 pages we're, we're doing uh the, the printer we use has uh 16 uh, 16 page are they called sets tony Signature, 16 pages per signature. Pages per signature, so it has to be a multiple of 16. Um, yeah, that, that's another reason we get, uh, why I get particular about page count, besides but besides the fact that I'm a CDO here. Um, I uh, I try to remember remember the impact of if we miss by, a, you know, even a word that kicks onto the next page, that's 16 pages of content either added with the associated cost of that times all the books we print, or the converse. So, so getting exactly on page count is, is really a, a significant financial change. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, 192. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will, I will certainly be looking forward to how, to how it develops. Again, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure there's going to be some there's going to be some more com more coming along coming along down down the road because, well. <laughs> The vibe, the vibe that I've gotten the last couple times I've talked with you guys is, 
Um, 23rd Century Studios is a, is a group of people with more passion than common sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Oh, or just or just more passion than sense, given the given the fact that if you if it weren't if if it weren't for the limitations, you'd probably ha you'd probably have a book the you probably have a core book the size of the, the size of the sixth edition hero system book. Okay, so to put it to rest, when we looked at how many pages we would have to print, we did debate seriously whether or not we just put it out in nine hundred pages. We decided to go with the current size, but we did think about it really hard. If and and I I just actually said we should just go PDF and then print it out in sections. And the one thing I'd like to point because we uh, again this falls to your 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 enthusiasm but lack of common sense because we wanted the 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 best quality materials for the book. I mean it's mm -hmm. printed on eighty pound glossy uh paper um i would wager even though there are books that are bigger you will not be able to find one that's heavier than ours um and it's just because the materials it's made out of that book should last forever even if you beat up a ram python with it <laughs> speaking from exp i hope i hope i hope to god you haven't tried you haven't tried using your books as a bludgeon I'm uh, speaking for uh, a friend. Yeah, a, a friend. Uh huh. He, uh, we can, we can he, neither uh, confirm nor deny the use of said book. I'll, I'll turn this over to uh, uh, executor now to, to speak for me. <laughs> we, we we actually had a request in fully armored to list the book under primitive melee weapons. Uh, <laughs> I get the feeling there was active debate about about whether or not you'd even whether or not you'd do that. I think it came down to space constraints again. Otherwise, it'd be in there. Yeah. Yes. Space was it. So it's an unofficial rule. D four. What strength bonus? Mm -hmm. Oh. But with but with all that said, I I would like to sincerely thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to my, come on to the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Mm -hmm. And thanks. thanks again. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to go over war stories invol involving battle lords, or j or just to shit post about the dice gods being true believers of equality and hating all of us the do the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged thanks again for having us mm -hmm. yep crown and spite here thanks for having us and and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>